The Lauder Center for Employment in the Negev is five years old and growing faster than ever, is packed every day with dozens of young job seekers as well as representatives of employment organizations, municipalities, and biotech and cyber companies. The uniqueness of the Lauder Employment Center is in its model for networking in the way that it became an overarching body bringing together all of the different employers in the Negev with thousands of young adults, with dozens of municipalities. It's not enough that we are researching the Negev and bringing the best students from Israel here. We also want to keep them here. We want to keep our computer scientists here. We want to keep our engineers here. We want to keep our social workers here. And through the Louder Center, we enable our students to find meaningful vocation, meaningful employment here in the South, and thus we really fulfill the dream of David Ben-Gurion in making the, the Negev flourish in all ways. We are looking for a million people to come to be in the Negev, young people. Talk is not enough. We need jobs. We need to create this place to be alive. The Louder Center is a partner in the network of hubs, technological job centers throughout the Negev, one in the Bedouin sector and one in the town of Dimona. Here, many young people receive professional guidance, practical tools, and business opportunities which were only possible in central Israel until now. Now we're seeing more and more each year that students are finding their future here in the Negev, are becoming viable places of employment, places for building their families, for enjoying themselves, for their social lives, that is viable and is necessary for the future of Israel. What the Lauder Center wants to do is exactly that. Take all students, all young people, in the moment that he finishes his academic career, and maybe a little before, and to build him a little bit, to build him a good job in the Negev, so that he will stay here. What does the year 2020 have in store for us? deepening our bond with the IDF and helping with employment solutions for the partners of career soldiers now that thousands of soldiers and officers have moved to the Negev. החזון של לאודר לראות את הנגב כקטר הצמיחה של מדינת ישראל וכך זה יהיה. Just as Zionism is constantly moving forward, our momentum never stops. Vision and reality come together at the Lauder Center, making the Negev a better, more promising place full of opportunities. I can tell you, Ronald Lauder, the Lauder Center, Jewish National Fund, all those ingredients, the capital of the Negev is Beersheba, and the Negev is the future of Israel. Vision and reality go hand in hand to turn Israel into a better place for our sons and daughters. I'm standing here in Addis Israel Synagogue in Sayag Harbor, Long Island, one of the oldest shuls in the United States. Um, I would like Rabbi Geffen to tell us a little bit about Addis Israel. Rabbi Geffen. Ambassador Lauder, thank you very much. I want to welcome all of you to the historic sanctuary of Temple Adas Israel. Our congregation began its story in 1896, and the first services were held in this space in 1898, almost 125 years ago, exactly the first Rosh Hashanah services. As legend goes, our first Torah was given to us, believe it or not, by Teddy Roosevelt. His soldiers, some of which were Jewish, were quarantined in Montauk after returning from a battle in Cuba. And after they broke camp, they looked for the closest synagogue in the area, and we were the closest by many hundreds of miles, I believe. Our history here is one of every denomination. We have had Jews of orthodoxy, of conservative, of reform, reconstructionist. This is a home for all Jews, regardless of background and one that we are immensely proud of. And we are honored and very privileged to have you with us together, uh, Ambassador Lauder, and to share these important remarks. And we wish all of you a Lashana Tova and a Gamar Chatima Tova, and may this be a good, sweet, peaceful, and wonderful new year for all of us. Thank you. I'm standing here in Addis Israel Synagogue in Sag Harbor, Long Island, one of the oldest shuls in the United States. 
Let me begin by wishing everyone who is watching this online a wonderful, healthy, happy, and better New Year. Throughout this past year of 5780, the Jewish people and all people have been challenged in ways we never imagined. Let us all hope that 5781 brings us much better tidings. But like Theodor Herzl taught us, we can't leave this to others. And we can't leave this to prayers alone. It's up to us. Our fate is in our hands. And in our hands, we have the power to make things better for the Jewish people and all people on earth. I would like to thank the Jerusalem Post for organizing this important conference. It's always an honor to be on a program with President Rivlin, even if only virtually. Our topic today is the future of the Jewish people. Frankly, this is the most important issue we can talk about at this time. The COVID-19 pandemic has upended everything this year. People have lost their jobs, schools have closed, and sadly, so many have become sick and died. I send my deepest condolences to all of you who have lost family members and friends. But it's important to remember that this virus did not distinguish between Jews and Muslims, between secular and religious, or rich and poor, and it reminds us all that we all share this planet together. But COVID-19 will eventually pass, and the Jewish people will endure, as we have endured throughout our long history. So I think that it's very important to consider how we will go forward and how we will thrive as a people in a post-pandemic world. Let me start by stating one important fact. The past, present, and future of the Jewish people is tied directly to the future of the Jewish state of Israel. And from Israel, there is good news, very good news. I was in the White House last week when I watched Prime Minister Netanyahu sign a peace accord with two important Arab states, the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain. With the guidance of President Trump, who deserves great credit for this, the normalization of relations between Israel and these Gulf countries will lead to a realignment of the entire Middle East. This will lead to new opportunities, economic cooperation and security. Israel's strong business community and technological, technological leadership are exactly what the Middle East needs now. The Arab states know this, and they want to be part of this great future. I am delighted and proud that the Jewish Council of the Emirates has announced it wants to, be, to officially affiliate with the World Jewish Congress. The Bahrain Jewish community is already part of the World Jewish Congress. And we also, we are in the process of building an exchange program through which a delegation of young Jewish leaders from around the world will visit the UAE to learn from their Emirati counterparts and meet with government officials. By getting to know one another, by working together and studying together in classes, that's how normalization will take place between Jews and Arabs. As president of the World Jewish Congress, I have visited 40 of the 100 countries that we represent. That makes up 98% of all the Jews in the diaspora. What I have learned is that the Jewish people today face four serious problems. A frightening increase in anti-Semitism, a growing division between religious Jews and those who are less religious, a division between diaspora and Israel, and a lack of Jewish education, along with a high rate of intermarriage. This is causing too many young Jews to leave Judaism. First, anti-Semitism. Right after World War II, when the entire world saw pictures of the death camps and the reality of what happened to European Jews, nobody in their right mind wanted to be associated with Nazis. We thought anti-Semitism had disappeared, but it never really went away. 75 years and three generations later, anti-Semitism has returned. It's come back with a vengeance. While it once just came from the right, 
it now comes to the left as well. And we are seeing it in places we never imagined, like colleges and universities, where professors are hired who are unrelenting in their criticism of Israel and Jews, where they are brazen in their support of the BDS movement. This is having a very negative effect on tens of thousands of Jewish students and non-Jewish students who are graduating with a negative image of Israel. Over the past year, we have some, seen some of those vile, irrational lies about the Jewish people resurface. Israel is still signaled out in the United Nations and held to a different standard than any other country on earth. There have been attacks in synagogues and against individual Jews. In Europe and throughout the diaspora, we have witnessed the same double standard from the left and growing neo-Nazi movement on the right. This past January 27th, at the 75th anniversary of the Soviet liberation of Auschwitz, I stood at the Auschwitz death gate. I told 50 world leaders that they are absolutely cannot be silent or complacent in, the, in, the, in this rise of anti-Semitism. The Holocaust came from the world's indifference to Jews. No one can be indifferent to anti-Semitism today. The second major issue we face is a strife within our own community. Religious against secular, secular against religious. If our enemies don't care if a Jew wears a kippah or never even put one on, why should we care? We see ourselves as one people always. The third point is a lack of caring between diaspora Jews and Israeli Jews. Too many diaspora Jews don't understand how absolutely important and key Israel is to the survival of the Jewish people. Many of them don't care, even care about Israel's future, and that is very dangerous. At the same time, too many Israels have ignored the diaspora. This must end right now. We are one people, and the safety and security of any Jew anywhere affects us all. Number four, education is, post, is the most important point for our future of our people. Too many young Jews are leaving their faith and tradition. They don't know what it means to be Jewish. They don't know the joys of Judaism. They don't know because they were never taught this. At the same time, too many young people have no idea what happened in the Holocaust. A recent survey tells us six out of 10 students don't even know about Auschwitz. This is completely unacceptable. I must change this. That is why I'm starting a campaign to save all Jewish schools and to create 100 new Jewish schools throughout the United States, 100 new Jewish schools throughout Europe, and new schools in Latin America and the rest of the Jewish diaspora. Jewish schools once, were once supported by wealthy Jewish philanthropists who understood their importance. But today, too much Jewish money goes elsewhere. We must reverse this. And every Jew everywhere must help. Everyone must share in this critical cause. Nothing is more important for the future of our people than education. And this must be for all Jewish students, especially conservative reform and even secular. Just as my foundation saw a transformation when I started Jewish schools throughout Central and Eastern Europe back in the 1980s, I want to see the same transformation throughout the Jewish world. We're meeting at the holiest time of year between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, a time when we consider the past and pledge ourselves to a renewed and better future. The high holidays serve as an excellent reminder that our work, while always advancing, is never truly done. I've told you some of the problems that we face, but if we face them together as one people, we can solve them. I want all of us to do this together. Liberal Jews and conservative Jews, religious Jews and secular Jews, diaspora Jews and Israeli Jews. I want everyone to become involved in building new Jewish schools. Five years ago, at the 70th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz, I shared the podium with a survivor of the camp named Roman Kent. This quiet, dignified man says something that I've never forgotten. And his words echo across the years. He said, we don't want our past, Mr. Ken said, 
to become our children's future. And I say this to you right now, that this must not let this happen. This is in our hands. It is up to us. No one else will do it. Join me, help me, and I say again, we don't want our past to become our children's future. And we must make sure this does not happen. It is in our hands. And to all my fellow Jews, L'shana Tava, Chach Sameach, may God protect you and bring you a wonderful year. And may he continue to bless the Jewish people. Thank you. We're honored to be joined by Israel's president, Ruven Ruvi Rivlin. Yaakov Katz and all the Jerusalem Post team, dear friends, this is a time of great optimism and a time of great challenges. It is a time of great optimism about our future. The historic Abraham Accords have opened the door to a new era of cooperation across the Middle East. I hope, I hope with all my heart that they will lead to a future of trust with our Palestinian neighbors as well. I would like to really talk to, the, to our friends, to our neighbors, to our cousins, the Palestinian people. We have to forget about the past. We have to look into the future. You have to understand as well that we have to understand that between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean, we are here all together. And let us really convince ourselves that we are not doomed to live together because in order to look into the future, we have to build a real confidence between ourselves and no one can help us but us. We have to trust you and you have to trust us in order to bring into understanding that will, that will make it possible for every one of us to understand how to live together. This is a must. This is our future. This is our interest. Interest of each one of us and interest of both of us. So let's build confidence and let's start to look into the future. We are the only one that can help ourselves. No one can do it for us. At the same time, this is a period of great challenges as we face both the medical and the economic effects of the coronavirus. We mourn every person who lost their life to the virus. And I know that many Israeli families are facing severe economic difficulties. The coronavirus has highlighted the deep divisions in our political system and public life and the weakening of the people's trust in the government. It is very dangerous. Now it is the time for each and every one of us to take responsibility. Decision makers, opinion leaders, and citizens of every background must work together to overcome this threat. Policymakers must take steps to help those who have been hurt by corona. And all Israeli citizens must show discipline to re and respect the instructions. If each of us take responsibility for ourselves and for each other, I am absolutely certain that the people and the state of Israel can overcome our current challenges and build, and build a future of peace and prosperity here at home and in the region. So thank you. Thank you very much. And Gmar Khatimatova and Shanatova. God bless all of you from Jerusalem.